Good evening, good seeing you guys. My name's Karsten. <laughs> oh. mm. Y'all, you guys are gonna make me blush. You're gonna make me blush. Man, I, I love this church, man. Here in $50,000 already of what God's been up to. I'm, I'm just proud of you guys. Uh, proud to call this church my family, my home. Uh, I did the math. I've been at New Life now a little over half my life. And you guys thought you were getting rid of me soon. No, no. Half my life. And I'm just, man, looking around. Uh, many of you guys, some of you are my family. Thanks for being here. Uh, many of you have uh, become like family to me. And it's been uh, special. I remember coming to this church in sixth grade, uh, not really knowing anyone, and uh, going to a summer camp, buying my first stick of deodorant, connected things. Um, <laughs> accepting Christ, you know, seventh grade to a message that Brandon Cameron was preaching. Man, my life has just been wrapped up in what God's been up to at New Life. Eighth grade, telling Wes I'm going to have his job one day. <laughs> still working at it, still working at it. Uh, tenth grade, getting baptized. Eleventh grade, meeting my wife at a summer camp. Uh, just uh, <laughs> some special. This church has become family. So thank you for being here tonight. I'm excited to jump into this message. Uh, new series called For the Love of God. Can you guys say it was just For the Love of God? Now, I don't know about you, but the first time I heard that we're doing a series called that, I'm like, that sounds kind of angry. For the love of God, I don't know, I don't know about you. I grew up out in Seabeck. My mom homeschooled five of us. She had plenty of reasons if she wanted to to say for the love of God. <laughs> plenty of, Carson, why did you fall out of your bedroom window again? What do you know? What are you doing, Carson? For the love of God. And so it's fun as we're getting, you know, ready for the series and kind of looking through and really what is the love of God and what does that mean for me? We're going through Ephesians 3. If you have a Bible, we're going to read a little bit here in a minute. We'll have it come up on the screen. But Ephesians, written to a church in Ephesus. And Paul's really, I mean, a church, a city much like our culture that understands love in a certain way. And Paul writes these words. When I think of all this, Ephesians 3, 14, when I think of all this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. Okay, pause really quick. When I think of all this, what, what is Paul thinking about? Well, Paul, for lack of a better sense, he's had his mind blown by the love of God. I mean, that's the season Paul is in right now. Have you ever been there? Paul saying, no, like, for, when I think of all these, Paul, grown up in a religious area, knowing God, knowing about God, could have recited the Bible, the Old Testament, back to you easily. Knew about God, and Paul realized something, had an encounter, an experience with Jesus, and it changed his trajectory. And Paul's saying, oh, when I think of all these things, realizing that God is building for himself a family. From two people groups. From people who spent their whole lives learning about God, and people who have never even heard of his name. And Paul's realizing that God's love is wide enough for both of them. Earlier on, it says this, the mystery is this, that people who have never heard of God and those who have heard of him all their lives, what I've been calling insiders and outsiders, they stand on the same ground before God. Paul is realizing that at the foot of the cross, it's even, and the love that God has for these strangers, the neighbors, and all these other people is the same love God has for me. When I think of all this, I fall to my knees. I pray, verse 16, that from his glorious, unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. Man, this is a church that I've experienced my roots growing down deep. Maybe you're here and you're wondering, like, hey, is this the church for me? Is this the family I want to be a part of? I pray you have the same story I do. Uh, you're standing there at your wedding day and you realize the people sitting next to you are all people that you've grown up with, people you've met at the church, and people you're doing life with, that your roots grow down deep. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, 
how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience, underline that, may you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life, the power that comes from God. Let me ask you this, how, how wide do you think God's love is? How wide do you think God's love is? Paul is in a season of realizing maybe God's love's a bit wider than I've made it. If you picture a box, Paul's saying, no, it's a, it's a bit wider. It's probably a bit longer, definitely taller and definitely deeper. God's love is bigger than we've made it. Paul, like I said, writing to a church that, that understood culture and love like we understand it. Uh, and we're going to be talking about this phrase in this series called this a love bank, a relational piggy bank. And we all have one. You and I have a love bank. Maybe you're like, Carson, I have not started an account yet. Well, we, we can talk after. I have great credit score. Okay, great. You can ask other people. Great credit score. We have a love bank. And, you know, the longer the bank is open, the longer we have that account, the more interest builds up. Maybe you, you started, you know, you met your spouse one day, and you're like, ooh, I want to open an account there. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to open an account with that. That's how it worked for me. I don't know how it worked. But Paul's writing to a church that understands this transactional love. Love used as a currency. Man, if, if I do this and you do this, then we'll love each other. If I do this, maybe people will love me. Transactional love. It's a relational piggy bank. My wife and I have a relational piggy bank, not that you want to hear about it. But we have deposits, we have withdrawals, and you do too with your spouse. You know, you have a relational piggy bank. If, you know, your, your, your spouse is getting home later from work, and you're like, oh, I got home early, I'm going to clean the house. She's going to get home, and the kitchen's clean. Women's like, take notes, take, take notes, honey. Room's clean. You're like, oh, I've just been thinking about you all day. I'm just put a $20 in that relational piggy bank right there. Maybe you're talking to your spouse, and you've got your phone in front of you. Yeah, just take that 20 bucks back out. No. My wife and I were on a road trip, and I'm complaining. I had an apple stuck in my teeth, and I was just complaining nonstop. So she took off a piece of hair and gave it to me for floss. <laughs> it was the most repulsive romantic thing that's ever happened to me. I don't know if it's a deposit or withdrawal. Some, something happened there, but yeah. Didn't tell us that in, in uh, pre-marriage counseling at all. Missed that week. <laughs> Relational piggy banks, withdrawals, deposits. Maybe you got kids and you left them at the bus one time. Yeah, you're not going to hear the end of that one. Yeah. yeah. Take that out. Maybe, maybe, not me, a friend. Maybe you forgot a sp specific day of the year. And it happens every year. Maybe it's a birthday or an anniversary. Yeah, just take that piggy bank, just kind of stomp on it a little bit. Break that. Yeah deposits, withdrawals, we have that. And if we're not careful, we do what the Ephesians started to do. We think because I have a relational piggy bank, because we have a relational piggy bank, it means that God must also. That my relationship with God is based off what can I deposit, and I don't want to withdraw too much, so I, I need to make sure I'm waking up when I'm reading my Bible. I'm doing all these things that are good, but if we're not careful, we think that my relationship with God is based on what I can do. Like I said, Paul's writing to a city much like our own, a city that understand, understood transactional love. It's actually a city that had one of the seven wonders of the world, the temple of Artemis, a place where if I wanted to worship, I would go and pay. If I wanted to worship, I would go and pay, and if I did that, I could sleep with a prostitute in the temple, and it would be the temple of, of uh, blessings of sex and fertility, and I'd worship that God. And the believers stepping out of this culture were still thinking I had to pay and make enough withdrawals or deposits, and that was my relationship with God. Paul is saying to them, listen, you might have a relational piggy bank. You might, be, you might understand transactional love, but God only understands transformational love. In fact, in 1 John, they would say that God is love. Not that God has love. Not that God um, has a love bank. Not that God knows the, the butterflies you feel in your stomach when you meet that person. Not any of that, but that God is love. That it goes deeper than this relational piggy bank. That's why Paul says from his unlimited resources, 
What he's saying is this. You might think that temple has deep pockets, but let me tell you about my God. My God, his unlimited resources. In chapter 2, it says his endless treasures. You might think you understand the deep pockets of worship and of grace, but let me tell you about my God. And I pray to that God, and I pray that you understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. So there I am sitting on a beach. I mean, it's in Oregon. Is it really a beach at that point? It's not sunny. It just has sand, no rocks. Seaside, Oregon, you been there? Oh, everyone's been to Seaside, apparently. <laughs> Sitting there, my wife and I, we, we take these trips as often as we can. We call them same page trips. We're making some deposits in that relational piggy bank, you know, getting away, talking about life. And on this one, she, remember we're on the drive and we're driving there and she says, hey, Carson, I, just so you know, these are my expectations by the time we leave here. So husbands, if your wife ever says that to you, pay attention. They're serious. She, I just want to know where you're at. Where are you at? Emotionally, physically, spiritually, mentally, where are you at? My honest response was, oh, God, do we really have to talk about that? Can we just avoid that moment? That would be a great trip if we could avoid that moment. Because if I'm being honest, um, I wasn't doing great in any of those things. I was in a season of my life when uh, someone had taught me uh, trending up and trending down. Where are you at with God? You're trending up. Are you and God on the same page? Every day you feel like you're growing closer to him. Or are you trending down? And uh, honestly, I was in a, a season where a day of trending down turned into a week of trending down, which turned into a month. And eventually I'd been in a season. I didn't know when it started and when it was going to stop of trending down and eventually kind of just flatlining, just being okay where I was with God. It's funny because... The love Paul's talking about doesn't seem like it's okay just doing this. He seems to think it's, it's worth leaning into. Now, I remember thinking, uh, I was reading, uh, doing a study about people called friend of God in the Bible. Friend of God. And I was like, okay, so I'm looking, I'm reading through the Gospels, and, and Jesus says this in the Gospels, if you've seen me, then you've seen God. Meaning the people Jesus spoke to and the way he spoke to them was the way that God would speak to them and the people God would speak to. And the, the people Jesus hung out with were the people God wanted to hang out with. So if we want to see, okay, how wide is God's love? You have to see then who did Jesus show the width of God's love to? So again, how wide do you think God's love is? We're going to look at four different areas of people where we see the width of Jesus' love. And really my hope, I was reading this and, and you're just like, man, God loves so much. I hope we can love like that. Is that what the message is about today? Honestly, I hope you walk away thinking, I should, I should love people better. I should love wider like God does. But you read Ephesians and God, Paul isn't saying, hey, you love like God loves. What he's saying is experience how God loves. Because we can't live it until we've experienced it. So Paul's saying, I hope you experience the love of Christ. So the first people that we see Jesus show the width of God's love to is this, is strangers. Now, if I'm being honest with you, and you can write that down, first point of the day, strangers. Now, if I'm being real with you, strangers are weird. I mean, it's in the name, strange-ers. It's, it's right there. And I'm sure people look at me and think, Carson, you're strange. You're wearing two different socks of really weird colors. That's just weird, Carson. I couldn't find the other one, okay? <laughs> strangers, I love stranger things, but that doesn't mean I love strangers. I mean, what, what is this? And we see Jesus start flipping the script. See, for me, I would say this. A stranger is someone I don't know and don't care about. Jesus would say a stranger is someone I don't know and I love like family. So you see in the Gospels, Jesus seems to spend a lot of time with people I try avoiding. You ever realize that? The people Jesus is spending time with, I'm like, oh, that's, wow, them? Really, God? Why them? See, in the culture that valued purity above everything, cleanliness above everything, if I was born with a deformity or I was born different than other people, I'd actually be cast out. 
Maybe I had leprosy, I'd be cast out. And it wasn't that I was just a stranger from God, I wasn't allowed to even worship God. I wasn't allowed in the temple. See, where Ephesus believed you had to pay to worship, Jerusalem thought you had to be clean to worship. And Paul's like, that's not the width of God. And we see in Jesus these people he spends time with. I remember Burkina Faso. Uh, I got sick. Anybody get sick at the worst times possible? Like, I, I don't get sick often, but when I do, I'm like, on my honeymoon? Really? We left two days early. Um, I just, I got, I just get sick at the worst time. So we're in Burkina Faso. I took a moped ride to a medical center, and uh, I'm in there, and the doctor's like, man, I think you might have malaria. We're going to do some tests, which isn't what you want to hear. Um, and so I'm sitting there, and the doctor comes back with the, our translator, and they're talking, and... He's like, okay, okay. Doctor says, uh, no malaria. I'm like, oh man, that's great. He's like, but, and you know, you go up a few octaves, and you're like, no, bring it down. Bring it down a few octaves. But, in, in Burkina Faso, test, sometimes no means yes, and yes means no. Retranslate, retranslate. That's not what that doctor just said. Please retranslate. So he's like, okay, okay, okay. Goes, goes in the other room, and I hear him talking. I'm like, there is no way this doctor just said that. Comes back with the doctor. Okay, okay, we figure it out. We figure, okay. Um, uh, doctor says uh, malaria is like being pregnant. You don't really know till you have the baby. False. There are plenty of ways to tell if you're going to have a baby before you have the baby. Plenty of ways. Plenty of ways. And so obviously I'm not in the best of moods. I'm sitting in the waiting center for my moped to come pick me up and take me back to my tent. And this woman walks in. In their culture, this woman walks in about 60 years old. In their culture, old. Not for us. Not for us. Just their culture. Just older. And uh, she sees me, and I don't know how else to describe it. She, she falls down and starts bowing to Jay and I. And I'm awkward. As, don't bow to me. Like, I don't know what to do. And so this woman, I'm like, oh, my gosh. Translator, please come back. So he comes back, and she's saying something. He's like, oh, she says she's, she's never seen someone like you. Awkward, sassy Karsten. Oh, a handsome man. <laughs> Not what she was saying, no. <laughs> Says, no, she's, she's never seen a, a white person before. She's asking if you will bless her and pray over her. So I'm like, oh, that's more serious than I thought this was. So I, I got, got down on the floor and tried getting eye level with her. And as, in that moment, I really, I, I began to see the love of God for a stranger. Someone I'd never met before, someone I probably will never see again for the rest of my life. And I saw the face of Jesus in her. Jesus flips the script. That's why I love being a part of a church that celebrates Freedom February, because it's people we've never met and might never meet. And God says, that's how wide my love is. That's how wide it is. The second people we see is this, neighbors. Neighbors. Jesus flips the script again. I have neighbors. Many of, has, of us have neighbors. Uh, I have a pair of neighbors I call the welders because they weld <laughs> all the time. 2.30 in the morning, welding away with the door open so I can hear it. I don't know. We went to a, a, a meeting with the rest of the members that own houses, and they called them things, not the welders, but things I can't say on this stage. Jesus gets asked a question. Jesus, what must I do to have eternal life? Great question. A plus. Jesus says, love God with everything you have and love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, but who's my neighbor, right? And again, living out in Seabeck, great question. <laughs> they're four miles away. I know they're the closest person to me, but really, still my neighbor. Jesus flips the script and tells a story about a, a Samaritan. 
See, in the Jewish culture, my neighbor would have been someone near me and someone like me. Jesus says, no, the love of God is wide enough for people near me and not like me. I was going to tell a story of the Good Samaritan, but I just got rocked this week reading Luke 7. And we don't have time to read it tonight, but I encourage you. Luke 7, God, uh, Jesus, we hear a story of Jesus eating a meal. Jesus is always eating food with friends. He's eating a meal, and he's at a, a food, eating food with a religious group. People that were all like each other, near each other and like each other, easy to love. Remember, someone near me and like me is easy to love because they're like me. That's easy to love, right? Jesus is like, no, how good are you at loving people not like you? And this woman walks into this dinner, and it's one of the most awkward moments in the Bible. She walks in, and the Pharisees say, oh, her. We know her. It says, a well-known woman, promiscuous woman, from the area, the city, the village, the neighborhood, Oh, we know her. And you can even see the Pharisees saying, yes, maybe near me, but definitely not like me. And the reason I love this verse is because if, if you think that you coming to God means that all you will hear is guilt and shame and how oh, you could have done better, Jesus meets a woman with a broken heart with soft words. That Jesus meets her eye to eye and says, I know where you are, and I hope you know that you are loved. God takes and flips the script. It's not just someone near me and like me. Someone near me and definitely not like me. That's the width of God. The third one is this, enemies. Now, I don't know about you. I don't have enemies. If I do, they haven't told me yet. Um, so you can get that out now if you want. Uh, I just don't have enemies. I don't wake up and think, hope I don't run into my arch nemesis today. Like, it's just, it's not a thought that crosses my head. MySpace had a top eight. That was easy. If they had a bottom eight, that would have been more awkward and difficult. I just, I don't have enemies. I'm part of a group called Alpha, and Alpha is a group for people who are curious or skeptical about Jesus. We have people who are like, yes, I believe, but I, I don't know what I believe. We have people who are like, maybe I believe, and people who are like, nope, not me. But we can talk about it. So I'm in this group, and we're hearing about this, this woman named Corey Ten Boom. Corey Ten Boom, you've heard of her? Amazing woman. She actually did preaching about forgiveness, and what she would say is an enemy is someone who we've changed the identity of. I, you know, I don't see that person as my father. I see them as the one who walked out on me when I was a kid. You've made them an enemy. What you're doing is you're changing the identity of someone who was made in God's image to someone who's done something wrong to you. An enemy. So she's preaching about this. And if you don't know Corey Ten Boom, she, her family harbored runaways and, and Jews during the Holocaust. Ended up getting caught. She was put in a concentration camp called Ravensbrück. In that concentration camp, her sister would die, her father would die, her family would be broken apart. She ends up surviving through this miraculously and begins preaching about forgiveness, seeing people as God sees them. And she's in Germany preaching about forgiveness. She gets off the stage and she sees someone. She said, I saw a man in the crowd who began to approach me. And as he got closer, I realized who it was. It was a guard from Ravensbrück. Not just a guard, it was her guard. It wasn't just her guard, it was the most cruel and evil guard, she said, in the entire concentration camp. She said, in that moment when I saw him, I did not see him as an older man. I saw him exactly as he was that day. He led my sister to be killed. She had flipped his identity. The man comes up to her and says, I don't know if you know who I am. She said, I do. He says, well, um, I know I've done some terrible, evil things in my life, but I've become a Christian now. I've accepted God's forgiveness. I've been praying, actually, that one day God will show me his grace and forgiveness by allowing me to ask one of my very victims to forgive me. Corey Ten Boom. Will that be you? 
We actually have a clip of her response that we're going to play really quickly. Bill, you forgive me. And I could not. I remembered the suffering of my dying sister through him. But I was not able, I could not, I could only hate him. And then I said, thank you, Jesus, that you have brought into my heart God's love through the Holy Spirit who has given to me. And thank you, Father, that your love is stronger than my hatred and unforgiveness. That same moment I was free. And I could say, brother, give me your hand. And I shook hands with him. And it was as if I felt God's love stream through my arms. You never touch so the ocean of God's love as that you forgive your enemies. Can you forgive? No. I can't either. But he can. The Gospels would say that forgiveness is how we show our love. Colossians 3 would say, because God forgave us, so we should really think about forgiving others. Because God forgave us, so just sweep it under the rug. Was it that big of a deal? Come on. No, because God forgave us, so we must forgive others. Forgiveness is a choice, but it's not an option. Forgiveness is a choice, but it's not an option. The fourth way we see the width of God's love is betrayers. God loving the, those who betray him. The ultimate sign of the width of God's love, in my opinion, was actually something we did about 20 minutes ago. Communion. Intertwined in the story of communion is one of the most profound ways God has loved because it's who God offered communion to. The night Jesus was betrayed, he washed his disciples' feet. All of them, including Judas. We actually see as Jesus says, I will be betrayed. Peter says, by who? Jesus leans over and says, by the person I share my cup with. In a culture where the seat of honor was next to the host, Jesus is saying this, the host is honoring Judas, the man who had betrayed Jesus in just a short few hours. The width of God's love. People, I would say, no, 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 no. Anyone but... Anyone but them. See, an enemy, I, I, a stranger could be my enemy. A betrayer, they have to be my friend. They have to be close to me. We see Jesus' love for even Judas. Jesus on the cross saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still Sinners, betrayers. You know, if I'm being real with you as I'm sitting on that beach in Seaside, I wasn't actually asking how wide is God's love. I don't think you're asking that question. What you're asking is, God's, is God's love wide enough for me? I was actually getting mad reading these stories of these friends of God. Because I read it and this was my thought. Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be so nice to be a friend of God? To be called a friend of God? Maybe one day, maybe one day I'll make enough deposits and I won't withdraw too much and maybe one day I'll be able to show God, God, call me your friend. Maybe one day it'll be said of me. And I finally came to the point where I just... <sighs> just been stagnant so long that I kind of got to that point and I was just desperate. And I remember praying and just crying my eyes out on the beach. I remember praying and said, God, can I be your friend? Can I be your friend? That's all I want. 
I realized in that moment, God isn't looking for someone to have a full piggy bank. God's looking for someone to have a genuine interaction with him, to be real with him, to say, God, this isn't where I thought I'd be. I didn't think I'd be struggling with that anymore. I thought my marriage would turn out differently. I thought my kids would care more about me. God, this isn't how I thought my life would be. And we see a God that responds with just love. A width of love, not just for all people, but a width of love for me, a friend of God. We're gonna pray and I'm gonna ask you to bow your heads and I'm gonna ask three questions. My hope is that all of us can respond with this. If you would bow your heads and pray. Maybe you're in here and, and honestly, you're, you and God are doing well. You're trending up. It's not that what you're putting out is good enough, but you're seeing that God is faithful and true and has never let you down. I'm just gonna ask if that's you. This isn't between me and you. This is between you and God. You're just having a moment with God right now. If that's you, would you raise your hand up? I just wanna pray and celebrate with God that you and him, you're, you're doing well. God, for those hands up, thank you. God, that you are faithful and true, that you never leave us. God, thank you that we are experiencing your grace. God, that we can say, I've experienced Christ's love for me. God, thank you. Thank you for those people. Maybe you're in here and you just say, Carson, I'm, I'm like you. I think I'm kind of stagnant. I've been closer to God, I've been further away, but right now I'm just kind of cruising. This is what I have to believe, that God's love is so strong. I'm not okay being apathetic towards it. That my response is either to pull back or draw near. I cannot stay in the middle. If you're in here and you'd say, man, I'm, I'm just... I've kind of flat, like I'm just going straight right now. If that's you, between you, will you just raise your hand? I want to pray for you. God, you know I've been there. God, those hands that are raised right now, I pray, God, would you draw near. God, that we would not be okay with where we are right now, but God, we would know that you want us to experience your love how wide it is, how long it is, how high it is, and how deep it is. God, that we would experience who you are, that our lives, God, we would know you and you would know us. God, whatever it takes, where we reach a point where we say, whatever it takes, I'm willing to draw near to you. Maybe you're in here and you were like me in a season of just trending down. You know, you've been closer to God. Maybe it's life didn't turn out the way you thought it would. Maybe uh, you're just, you feel distant. Again, between God, you and God, I'm asking you to raise your hand. If that's you, if you feel like you were trending down, a real honest moment, would you raise your hand? I wanna pray for you. God, your love is good and faithful and true. God, you desire nothing more than for us to open the door and you share a meal with us as friends do. God, for those who feel distant from you, God, you haven't moved. You haven't moved. God, show us in our lives how, God, can we experience your love? And God, would you continue to draw near to us? For every one step we take, God, you've taken a thousand. Draw near to us. Last, and I said three, I lied, there's four. Maybe you're in here and you're thinking, Carson, I haven't even opened that account. Carson, I'm sitting and you're, you're telling me about this grace and this love of God that's wide. I've never experienced that ever. And you're in here and you're thinking, I want that grace. I want that freedom. I want the promises of God. I'm going to ask you again, between you and God, to boldly just raise your hand and say, that's what I want. That's what I need. Yes, I see you. Anyone else? Yes. 
God, your love is all we need in this world. God, right now, would you show up in those hearts that raise their hand? Would they look in the mirror and see a different person, a new creation? The old is gone and the new has come, and God, you are near to us. God, I thank you. God, you've never let me down. God, you never fail to exceed my expectations. God, in this moment, would we experience your love? Would we know, God, the width, the length, the height, the depth? God, speak to us. We are willing. We are here. And God, we love you. Thank you for the grace you've shown me, the kindness you've shown me. Thank you, God.